Coming up next on this edition of In the City, the sounds of summer are heard at Oakland's Park. Also, Arts Integrated School Bradley Academy puts on the musical Annie Jr. Plus, new water meters have been installed within the last year for Murfreesboro Water Resources customers, and a new extension to the Greenway is underway near Barfield Crescent Park. We'll tell you about all these stories and a lot more coming up right here on this edition of In the City. Welcome to another edition of In the City, your source for what's happening right here in the city of Murfreesboro. I'm Mike Browning. The Tennessee Vintage Baseball Association was established in 2012 and plays an extensive schedule in 2018. A Murfreesboro Park is one of many venues used to play this 19th century rule of baseball. If you drove by Oakland's Park recently, you might have seen a baseball game with players that look a little different. Players from the Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball League now claim the park as one of their venues they used to recreate the pastime of 19th century baseball. We play vintage baseball by the rules of 1864. Uh, Civil War barehanded baseball, no gloves. Uh, the rules at that time, uh, the striker, the batter, would be out if the fielder caught it on the first bounce. Uh, ball was fair or foul by where it hit first. So if it hit spinning and went out of bounds, still a fair ball. Uh, batter couldn't overrun first base, otherwise he could be tagged out. Uh, other than that, it's, it's baseball. Pitcher's job is to deliver a pitch for the hitter to hit. It's, it's an offensive game. You see some fantastic plays in the field defensively, but the pitcher, it, it's underhand, open-handed, and no, no tricks, no nothing. I played baseball through high school and college, a little bit after, coached Little League for 17 years, and. I'm 68 years old and I'm playing baseball again. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I think I played like 67, 68 games last year. The people I've met, we've got nuclear physicists, heart surgeons, lawyers, farmers, all walks of life that do this over the singular love of baseball. At first glance, baseball players without gloves is the first thing you notice. Brewer talks about using your bare hands instead of a glove. Those of us that played a lot of ball, it didn't really seem to matter. I mean, you learn how to catch the ball. It's a little bit different, a little bit of give to it when you, you know, when you catch. But uh, otherwise, I don't know, you don't think much about it. We cheer for the other team when they make a good play, the same as we would our team. Um, and, and it's all, all in good fun, but yet competitive as can be. It's all free. There's no admission to any of it. Uh, family atmosphere. Um, all the players, you know, we're, we're available to answer any questions anybody might have. Um, you know, bring a blanket, cooler, picnic basket, and, you know, sit down and watch baseball. We generally have two games at each venue when we play. Every place is a historical venue. Uh, not all of them is as level and, and cleared as this is. Some of them, some of them are. The backstop's ours. We throw up a backstop and we play ball. And hey, where can you go to watch baseball and have a live band playing between each inning? Brewer talks about how you can get involved to play in this league or get the schedule to all the games. Our schedule is already posted on our website, Tennessee Vintage Baseball. Uh, there's also an interest form on that website, anybody that's interested in playing. We've got eight teams in the Nashville, Franklin, Murfreesboro area two teams in Chattanooga, two teams in Knoxville. This is just way more fun than any 68-year-old ought to be allowed to have. Uh, we have a ball. It, it's all families. Uh, we, we Great friends, you know, people we've met and everything. And, and it, it's, you know, it, it's unbelievable. A classic musical was recently produced at a Murfreesboro City School where students can express themselves artistically in many ways. Bradley Academy Elementary School is an art-integrated school, which is an approach to teaching where students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. One of the things that drew me to the school is that it is an arts-integrated school, and those are so rare to find for elementary. I taught high school for seven, eight years, 
So to find a school, an elementary school that valued the arts, to have art, library, music, band, and drama was amazing. It's really cool because some schools, like some elementary schools, they don't like have, they don't have things where you get to do plays, like they're not an art school, but here we focus on your education and your dreams. So it's not where you get to push your dreams in the back of your head and don't think about them until you're older. It's just like you get them now. So that's something that's really important to me about Bradley. In our special area, we have art, music, drama, and library, and PE. So all students, even if they're not in drama or choir, they get to do drama and music and art. We do have students that have lots of experience to be as young as they are, um, like Jada Gatewood since her third performance. She's in fifth grade. That's really impressive because I didn't have those options in school. So for her to have her third performance and not even be in middle school yet, that's huge. There's at least one play or musical that Bradley does a year, and this year was Annie Jr. It is one of the best loved and award-winning musicals. One of the things that people love about Annie is that's a classic, and people remember Annie. And with the new movie that came out several years ago, there's been an increase in interest in Annie. Um, a lot of the kids know the songs. We've been talking about it in my class. It's just interesting to see a fresh approach to such an old story that still works in this time. I like this play because it brings back the old to the new, and it gives little kids to see what Annie is really about. In Annie Jr., I play Miss Hannigan. She's very, like, evil and conniving. Like, she, she doesn't care about anybody, and she's very, like, self-centered. She thinks the whole world revolves around her. Like any extracurricular activity, a lot of practice and preparation goes into the musical. We asked, going into opening weekend, about a typical week of rehearsals. We started with auditions and we have rehearsals. We rehearse these kids Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and um, then we added Fridays. In the past three weeks, it's been like four or five days a week. So they're here after school, one to two hours, running lines, singing songs, learning choreography. We work them hard and to see um, their excitement about our show is really, it's exciting to us. It takes a long time because you have to memorize the dances, memorize the lines, your cues, and you have to try to cooperate with other people because if you don't, if you know what their line is before yours, you would know what yours is. We just like go through our lines a lot in practice and we run through it a lot and he gives us like notes on different things that we need to do. A good performance usually means you are able to connect with your character. The performers talk about finding that connection. I play Annie and my character is an orphan who's lived in an orphanage her whole life. Rooster, he's, he's a bit of wannabe. He wants to be anybody who has money. He would do anything to get money or take somebody else's. I was just trying to imagine myself as an orphan and see how what the words that she said came across to them and then I would try saying it and then I would try to see if I could like like build up my like confidence of being mean to them so that's one thing that kind of helped me with that. Inspiring others seemed to be a theme of why these kids chose acting for their hobby. So we asked, what do you like about being in plays and musicals? I I just like where you get to be cool characters and like sometimes get out of your comfort zone. I get to like bring this story to life so they can like feel something and they might want to try to like do something like this in their life. I really like to sing and um, I like singing and stuff and I don't like talking to people that I don't know that much. <laughs> like me. <laughs> I think you're always nervous and I always tell my kids um, being nervous proves that you care and you want to do a good job. I feel really good 
about what they've done and how much work they've put into it. Each um, rehearsal and each performance, they keep adding a little gesture, a little look at another character, and it really elevates their character. To see the growth in them from September to now has been huge, just to see how much they've grown and become better performers. The city began installing advanced meter infrastructure in 2016, a smart water solution that helps detect leaks and efficiently manage meter reading. Murfreesboro's Water Resources Department explains the new water meters installed inside city limits. Many Murfreesboro Water Resources Department residential and industrial customers know that in the past year, new water meters have been installed. More than 26,000 meters have been changed citywide. The new system is called AMI, Automated Meter Reading Infrastructure. Reading meters has changed over the years. Prior to this, everything we read was manually read. A person had to come physically to your house each month and read the meters. Now we've advanced. We're reading everything by new technology. It's all read by antennas. Uh, each meter has a repeater that it reports to, and then it goes to a collector, which then comes to us, and we can pull this, and we get your meter readings each month. We do not keep someone from getting in the meter, uh, but if you are going to access the meter, there are some things I'd like to show you now because there are different components in there that can be damaged. We can show you how to do that properly. Randy McCullough explains new features of the water meter and how it will affect you if you have to get into your box. Your meter box will look identical to what it did before we done the meter change out. The only thing you'll see differently is on some of the meters, it will have an, a piece on top, which is a round disc, but this is a antenna. And if you are going to have to remove your water meter lid, please remove the lid slowly, because as you'll notice, there are wires attached, and they will pull loose or it will break the antenna. If you pull this antenna wire loose, then we lose reception to the meter and then we'll have to make a trip to your home to troubleshoot to figure out what's wrong, replace the antenna. In the normal meter box before we went AMI, all you would see in your meter it would be the meter. This is an antenna also, it's called an ERT, but it is attached to the meter, and as you'll notice, it's still got the same cutoff that it's always had, and you will proceed to cut the water off just as normal. And if you'll notice, right below your cutoff, there is a piece uh, extra on some meters. It's called an M log. This is a device for the water department to have to detect a leak out on its main line. But it also has wires running to it and can be damaged if not careful when you're working inside the meter box. And one thing we would like to ask you to do now that we do not visit your residence every single month to read your meter, we used to keep the grass from being over the top of the meter. During your mowing time, if you don't mind, just please weed eat over it and keep the top of the lid clean for us. McCullough provides some tips on how to find water leaks on the customer side of the water meter, which is from the meter to your house. If you happen to receive a bill and you feel like the bill is a little too high, there's ways you can check for leaks without having to contact us by simply making sure everything is turned off in your home. Go out to your meter. You can look at the little red dial. If it does show movement, and it's a continuous movement, first thing you need to do is go into your house, check your restrooms. Make sure you don't have any commodes running. Your next step would be cut your commodes off, come back out to the meter, see if it's still running. If it is still running after you cut your commodes off, then it means you have a leak more than likely either under the house or underground. There are more areas in the house that could be leaking, sinks, dishwasher, etc. But if those are leaking, there should be water visible in that area to indicate a leak. Now, if you do know that the leak is inside your house, or you're aware it's under the house or underground, on your side of the meter, that is the customer's responsibility to repair. You will need to either call a repromer or repair it yourself. But if you happen to look in the meter box and there is water in here, it is better to call us and let us come and do the investigation. The number you can reach us at is 615-893-1223. There is no charge for us to come out and check for a leak in the meter box. 
The Murfreesboro Greenway is one of the most popular parks in the area. Another extension of the trail is under construction off Veterans Parkway. Here's more on Phase 4 extension near Barfield Crescent Park. We're at uh, Barfield Crescent Park, uh, where essentially we'll end uh, the, uh, the, the Stones River Greenway Trail on the, the south side. Winter construction now, you can kind of see behind me the guys are, are, are working, but uh, this is a little un, unusual section of the uh, the Greenway Trail. Part of it goes along the, the Stones River, but part of it actually goes along uh, Veterans Parkway. It actually starts at uh, where the last section of the Greenway Trail end, ended, which is along uh, Barfield Road. People have kind of used a little pull-off point there, but we thought it was important to uh, to connect to all the way to the park, uh, give kind of a, uh, a termination point, if you will, and uh, and kind of finish out the uh, the Greenway Trail on uh, on this side of town. Eventually, the, the trail will connect on the north side of, uh, of town all the way to uh, Seagull Soccer Parks. So you essentially will have uh, the trail. Uh, either alongside the road or along the river connecting three of our major parks. And you think about it, Barfield Crescent to Old Fort and then eventually all the way up to, uh, to Seagull Soccer Park. Of course it'll have trailheads uh, all along through there. You know, Some of the trailheads are existing. We're building uh, a couple of more little, little parking areas along with this uh, that will allow people to kind of jump on at, at, at any, any part. This portion of it is about five and a half million dollars. It's, uh, it's, it's partially funded with state and federal money as well as we have, of course, we have local money uh, to, to go along with it uh, also. We bought uh, extra right away whenever we actually built Veterans Parkway because we knew that, uh, that we'd be building the trail along it uh, later. And then, of course, you got curb and gutter uh, where it's not a, it certainly is not a barrier, but uh, there is some separation. And it's a little bit wider too, so you have the ability to. Uh, to get away from the road just from the sheer width of it. And it also, you know, the width of the trail also encourages uh, bicyclists to, uh, to use it if they, uh, if, if they want to. And then, you know, we always have the, uh, the skateboarders that like to come out and use it as well. The old uh, Barfield um, Crescent Road Bridge is actually being converted into a pedestrian bridge with this. So you'll, you'll actually, you'll go under the new uh, Veterans Parkway bridge to kind of get across Veterans Parkway, come up on the other side, and it'll actually, will cross the, uh, the river uh, with the uh, with the old bridge, so that's uh, you know that's something that's kind of neat. We left that in place whenever we built the new bridge, uh, so we could con convert it to a pedestrian uh, uh, pathway. It's one of the most popular parks that we have. I mean, all you have to, have to do is just be on there on a, on a pretty day. You don't have to be on the weekends. You know, it's it's well used. And there's a lot of different opportunities too. You know, you can uh, you can kayak some along the, uh, the the river. I know my son likes to go fishing along the uh, trail. So you'll 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 see people fishing and just people just uh, you know throwing a blanket out and uh, just enjoying the day along it. So it's you know it's a linear park, but it's a yeah, it's definitely one of the one of the most popular uh, par features of parks and recreation that we have. Did you know Lineball Public Library hosts monthly book signings and is proud to promote local authors from right here in our area? If not, here's what you've been missing. We're here at the Line Ball Library right here in downtown Murfreesboro where there's lots of fun for the whole family and a great place to bring the kids. And today there's a book signing with local authors. Line Ball Library has a little something for everyone and it's always exciting when local authors come in to sign books and talk about their work. We love our authors. We have so many local authors in the Murfreesboro area and Rutherford County that we really want to just share them with the community. Many people don't realize how much talent we have here in Rutherford County. And so having a monthly book signing where uh, an author can come and sit at a table and sell their books, but not just sell their books, but talk to our people that come in, it really gives them a connection with the community and they learn about it and I just think it's a great way to get to know our authors. Authors Cynthia Landis and Michelle Shelley stopped by to visit and tell about their collaboration, a new children's book based off real animals from their very own farms just a few miles from Murfreesboro. It's a story about how a crippled lamb and an orphan calf come together and through a series of mistakes, they save the family farm. The two women say they came up with the idea for the book and the characters when they both attended a conference in Kentucky. 
we were talking about the animals on our farm and how funny they are and how much fun they are. And we wrote the story based on their actual personalities. Children love the book because of the fun characters, and parents say they love it for its message of strength, faith, and appreciation for the environment. Linebaugh has events for folks of all ages, from babies to seniors, from story times to learning how to garden. So there's always something happening. We have seminars. People are offering free informational sessions. So just continue to look at the website and look at our calendar there, and you'll find out what's going on. All library events are free and open to the public. Reporting for City TV, I'm Michael Lynn White. A Murfreesboro City School prides itself on a program that aids students in learning and character. On this day, they open the doors to other learning institutions. Mitchell Nielsen is a Leader in Me school. Leader in Me is a program that helps develop a culture of leadership by teaching, modeling, and practicing Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. These habits are be proactive, begin with the end in mind, Put first things first. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Synergize and sharpen the saw. We did a tour of a school in Clarksville that had a very similar demographic to ours, and we saw what the Leader in Me program was doing for them, and we knew we wanted to bring it back to our kids. We saw how the kids internalized the seven habits and how they could use that as a uh, way to guide their lives. You know, it takes a lot off of us because the students are solely responsible for just about everything. I mean, they, they do everything here. Everything is student-led, but also, um, you know, just practicing the seven habits and, and talking about those and really living those in our classroom has helped me as a teacher really live those outside of um, the classroom, which teachers have a really hard time doing, you know, the, finding that balance. I like Leader in Me because it helps me a lot when I'm at home. And I like it at school because if I'm in a problem with one of my friends and we get into an argument, I could use one of the habits to help me out. If somebody's like not doing well in school and like is bullying other people, you help them get better at being nicer and um, helping them be, become a leader and not being a follower. So that's what Leader in Me means to me. Not only is Mitchell Nielsen a leader in me school, it has been designated as a lighthouse school. This recognition means the school has completed a two-year training regimen as well as an extensive on-site review. There are more than 3,000 Leader in Me schools worldwide. Only 356 of them are lighthouse schools. Mitchell Nielsen is one of them. To become a lighthouse school, it's a, a rubric that we have to follow and it includes the culture of the school how we integrate the seven habits into our curriculum and how much we train our kids and how what the buy-in is from the kids and the staff. Because of Mitchell Nielsen's lighthouse status, the school hosted a leadership day. Schools in different cities tour Mitchell Nielsen to learn more about the Leader in Me program. They get to go around and see how we have implemented Leader in Me in our schools. Some of them are already in the process of uh, Leader in Me. Some of them want to be Leader in Me schools. So uh, they are here seeing what we do and then take those ideas back to their schools. Our school is actually in their Leader in Me process. We've been in it for several years. We're trying to get our lighthouse status. And this was my first year at the school, so being able to see what kindergarten data binders look like and their leadership notebooks would kind of help me within the classroom but our school is well on their journey. Today I was asked to be the MC um, at the beginning of the conference um, and now I'm doing the job of being an ambassador. So I would politely shake their hand and ask if they have any questions and if they go through my leader notebook I can tell them what it's all about and stuff. The tour began with a greeting from students and a song from the school chorus. The tour included two buildings since Mitchell Nielsen has a pre-K through second grade building and a third grade through sixth grade building. Leader in Me is definitely integrated throughout the school curriculum. A visual presence can be seen everywhere. It's really helped me um, just kind of find that balance and um, continue practicing it not only you know here every single day but also like with my family outside of school. I just think Leader in Me has made such a difference in, in my life, in every teacher's life, in our relationships we have here, too. Um, I'm, I couldn't say enough about it. 
The 41st annual Uncle Dave Making Days Festival, or Roots Rendezvous, is scheduled for July 13th and 14th of this year. Recently, a press conference was held at the Rutherford County Chamber of Commerce to announce the musical acts. The tourism economic impact in Rutherford County for one year is $331 million, and those numbers reflect a 4.9% increase over the previous year, which is well above the national and state average. And our most recent star report shows that 1,142,000 hotel room nights were sold within the last 12 months. And that is 52,000 room nights over the previous year. And this increase is due primarily uh, to the many events that we host every year. And Uncle Dave Making Days contributes $1.2 million every year towards our numbers. And I think that deserves a round of applause. And Uncle Dave Making Days has been recognized as one of the top festivals in the state and once again recognized by the Southeast Tourism Society last year as being one of the top 20 events in the Southeast. Not just Tennessee folks, but the Southeast, and we're certainly proud about that. Let me make another comparison. The Opry itself is over 90 years old. We'll, we'll have the 100th anniversary in 2025. This festival is 40, going on 41. That's an amazing accomplishment for a local institution. And both of, those, both of those institutions, the Opry and this festival, have the same start point. The life and career of Uncle Dave Macon. My grandfather was big in promoting bluegrass and old time music and as Ben told you, 42 years ago, he was on the golf course with Johnny Bragg and John Bragg came to him and said, Tom, you know, Uncle Dave was not too far from here. We need to get something started to honor him. You know the people, let's make it happen. And he did. Pop was planning on being up here last year for the 40th. He couldn't make it because he had a stroke. He was real sick. But he's here with us now. So thank you, Ben. And I hope you all can be there to see my grandfather get the Heritage Award. The Trailblazer Award for this year is Rhonda Vincent. <laughs> she is the first person to hold the Heritage Award winner and Trailblazer winner collectively in the history of our community. What a special honor. Thank you so very much. I'm proud to be here this morning. And it's so excited to come back to Uncle Dave Macon Days. I love that it, it merges, you know, young, talented musicians. It's a chance for the youngsters. You get in contests, you get to um, have this wonderful camaraderie with with other you know youngsters and not only of, of all generations and that's the wonderful thing uh, Uncle Dave Macon Days like many uh, festivals it's family entertainment uh, I'm very excited to to get to release a project uh, here at Uncle Dave Macon Days for a couple of different aspects uh, the project was filmed it's a DVD it's also a CD it was filmed at the Ryman Auditorium and if it's okay, I would like to reveal for the very first time the cover of that project that will be released July 13th. And all of these guys are scheduled to be with us at 5 o'clock on July the 14th to celebrate the release of Live at the Ryman. For the first time anywhere. In other news, Murfreesboro City Schools honored 24 teachers during their Teacher of the Year ceremony. These teachers were chosen for their commitment to teaching excellence. They are Rhonda Melson and Kimberly Nielsen at Black Fox, Jamara DeBerry and Stephanie Turner at Bradley, Michelle Fallis and Nicolette Sanders at Cason Lane, Bess Turner and Tyra Vance at Discovery School, Angela Pope and Patrick Thomas at Irma Siegel, Amy Brooks and Judy Hens at Hobgood, Sasha Burnett and Rebecca Tate at John Pittard, Sydney DeBerry and Sayward Ratliff at Mitchell Nielsen, Janice Ferris and Karen Godwin at Northfield, Jessica Burns and Mallory Eaton at Overall Creek, Alicia Bird and Shiloh Siegel at Reeves Rogers, John Harding and Liz Ruby at Scales. Also, Angela Pope and Jamara DeBerry was selected as Teacher of the Year well, that's it for this edition of In the City. As always, for more information about the city of Murfreesboro or any of the stories that you've seen here, you can always visit our website at www.murfreesboro.tn.gov. 
And if you want to see one of the stories that you've seen here today or catch up on some of the latest city news, you can always visit the City of Murfreesboro YouTube channel. I'm Mike Browning, and until next time, we look forward to seeing you right here in the city.